All right, good afternoon. Thank you all for uh, sticking out for this last session of the day. Um, my name is Bamsi Sangavarapu. I'm here with my colleague uh, Ritesh Rai. We are from American Express, here to talk to you about uh, how we are elevating our internal serverless function as a service platform with Wasm components and Wasm cloud. And we are from American Express, like I said. Yeah, uh, so how many of you guys have used American Express credit cards? Oh, quite a few. Everybody likes the platinum card, right? Especially people who like to travel. So when you think of American Express, I think you think about credit cards and the incredible customer service. We are also a tech forward company. We, as a company, make a lot of open source contributions. We build uh, frameworks, tools, and utilities which make that incredible experience possible. So we are from the platform engineering team. And, yep. Yeah, so one of the platforms that I lead uh, is called, I don't say the name, but it is called, it is a functional service platform. Um, and uh, what we will talk about today, I know you have had a lot of, I know you're all WASM enthusiasts, you know about the technology, you are here for a reason, you've heard a lot of talk about the technology, but we are slightly different, we're going to start talking about what we are using WASM for. So our purpose is not to somehow find a use case for WASM, but we have a platform, and we are trying to see how we can take the platform to the next level with WASM. So to begin with, we'll start talking a little bit about what this platform is. Um, and why do we need this platform? So as, a, as an application developer, when you are um, setting out to solve a business problem, write some application, write a microservice, uh, before you get to the actual core part of uh, business logic, there is a lot of other concerns that are on your mind. You need to make a lot of decisions. You want to start with what's the development framework I'm going to use. You may have a language of choice, but there's a lot of options in terms of what frameworks to use. You need to make decisions on what are other utilities that you can reuse uh, in the enterprise context. You need to think about deployment pipelines. You need to think about how am I going to observe this once I put it in production, what observability tool chains and platforms I need to use. And you're going to talk about where am I going to deploy it, how am I going to operate it, how am I going to scale it. And between all this, you also have to think about the real application logic. So all these big clouds are really distracting you from the core business of why you are setting out to do the development. And our function as a service platform is trying to take all those big clouds out of your mind as a developer so they can focus on business logic. That's that's, uh, that's the core purpose of this functional service platform. And this is an ecosystem. So it's a platform, there's a framework, there are tools that come with the platform and there is a strong community around it, which is super critical for anything to be successful. And as a platform, this is the core of it, right? So the serverless platform, this is what we manage the infrastructure, we take care of operating it, we take care of scaling it uh, up and down as necessary. I will talk about the next two points, a little bit uh, resource sharing and interfunction calls um, in a double click later. But the platform also comes with pipelines, observability out of the box. So people don't have to think about observability, it comes with uh, running on the platform. And many of these functions, why we call them functions, are APIs. And these APIs have to be secured. And that requires a lot of work to integrate with the tooling that is necessary to provide authentication and authorization. All of this, again, comes out of the box with the platform. Um, and then from a framework perspective, uh, all these functions, they provide a contract. They expose an interface. And these interfaces are written in uh, open API spec. And uh, uh, we encourage contract-first development. And there is a standard workflow that is used to develop these functions. And we have multiple runtimes. We have a JVM-based runtime that's used to write functions in Java and Kotlin. There is a Node.js-based runtime that's used for writing functions in JavaScript and TypeScript. And talking about some of the decisions that developers have to do, we also have make some of these decisions. Uh, so for example, on the Java side, uh, 
we use Vertex as a library for providing asynchronous uh, programming interfaces. Uh, all in the interest of developers getting to their business quickly without having to worry about all these uh, additional concerns. And every function has to deal with some amount of encryption. They need to worry about how am I going to manage configuration. When we talk about configuration, contract configuration as uh, contract and versioning, right? Contract versioning as well as the implementation versioning. Uh, open API spec, again, in a large enterprise, there are lots of different varieties of how people do things. And uh, there are schema linters to make sure that the spec is uh, as per the standard, makes it simpler uh, to operate and manage. And once again, because of all these features, there's a lot of uh, developers who gravitate towards it. And because they are all now, these low level decisions are made for them, uh, uh, there is standardization. They can learn from each other. They are all operating on the same platform using same libraries, same ways of developing workflows. So uh, there's a lot of uh, cross learning and uh, contributions that are happening all around. Uh, so that's our ecosystem. And this provides for different personas, different benefits. So if you think about developers, for developers, we said all these cross-cutting concerns are addressed so that developers can, you know, minute one, they start talking about a problem, they can get to the business logic quickly. They can just leverage everything that is there. Uh, one other thing we provide for the developers here is, because of the standardization, internal mobility. Right? You go from team to team, you don't have to learn new technology, new libraries, new ways of doing things. They can take their learnings and their expertise and be productive on a new team uh, right away. Data architects, because these are APIs that are documented in a standard way, uh, the platform also provides ways to easily discover them avoid duplication of APIs because they are discoverable. They can reuse where they don't, you know, they don't have to develop new. And uh, give us, a, give us a control plane for management and governance. And information security. Again, one place to look at what APIs are there in the company is something that they really love because trying to find in a large enterprise, what are all my endpoints? Where are they? You know, <laughs> that is a big, problem and uh, giving a single point of enforcement for any security controls is a big benefit for and makes the burden on InfoSec that, that much less. And SRE, uh, again, from an operations perspective, because of the out-of-the-box observability, your enterprise hello world already comes with all these things built in. Um, logs, metrics, distributed traces as a distributed platform and microservices, super important. And all of this comes uh, pre-built uh, with this platform. And what do we use this for? Some of the typical use cases, uh, we have a lot of backends for frontends. So one of the other teams I have is a frontend uh, framework that is used to build the website that powers AmericanExpress.com. When you log in, to manage your card, that website is built on one of our frameworks, and a lot of backend API calls are built on this, uh, you know, functional service platform. And like I said, a lot of these APIs are IO-bound workloads. They hit a database, they gather some data, they make some updates and things like that. And from that to also micro monoliths, there are some entire applications that are decomposed into very small functions. All of them are running with, within this platform. Uh, what makes this like um, so attractive? Other than uh, everything else that we talked about, from a platform perspective itself, the deployment unit is not a container. It is a small package of functions. So if you Java, it is a jar. And it's for JavaScript. It's a small bundle of uh, JavaScript that's getting deployed. Because of smaller size compared to a big container that needs to be deployed and started, the cold starts are much better uh, in this platform when you're deploying functions. And once again, from a large enterprise context, many times applications are organized around lines of business, 
based on teams who are owning it. So every team has their own application, they deploy it and they operate it. And uh, when you need to build a journey that cuts across applications, they have to hit the network. They have to leave the box, they have to go from their pod to somebody else's pod and that's inherently inefficient because you are leaving the box and you are hitting the network. What we do with this platform is we blur those lines between applications and uh, ownership and lines of business. All, of, all functions are running in the same platform and that gives us some additional levers to co-locate functions that are required in a customer journey in the same pod. So function to function calls are super efficient. They don't hit the network. And because we are aggregating the workloads across application boundaries, we have the ability to further optimize resource utilization. And these are important as we talk about WASM because this is the USP of this platform that we want to elevate to the next level. Um, just a little bit of a quick um, scale of the platform. Um, 1,500, give or take, active developers writing code every day, uh, deploying it on this platform. And this is probably one of the biggest platforms that unifies developers across the company. There are a lot of developers, I probably can't say how many are there, but they all are working on different, different applications and different, slightly different technologies and tool chains. And this is one unifying factor because of uh, what we've talked about. And so with this widely successful platform, when we think about where do we, where do we go next? What else do we need to do? Um, engineers that we talk to, there are, we've talked about the Java developers and the Java and Kotlin developers, JavaScript, TypeScript developers. There are certain teams who are really interested in Go and they only want to develop in Go, but they want our platform. So there is a need to support them on this platform. Similarly, there are some data science uh, developers who only want to develop in Python because that's their ecosystem, that's their expertise, and but they want to leverage the platform. So uh, what I want to do is I want to bring these other ecosystems into the platform, and I want to do it in a way that I don't have to write one more runtime for Go, one more runtime for Python and maintain it. So uh, that's one of the things we are looking at, additional language support without corresponding increase in the runtimes. And then while we have a high density of functions compared to containers, there's still some common libraries, database drivers, things like that, that are bundled into each of the function packages. And we want to see how we can break it out and make the functions even smaller, further increase the density. And as we are looking at exploring these options to do this, especially like, you know, one runtime for multiple languages and very, very small, tiny functions, um, that's when we started exploring WASM components. I won't spend much time on this, you all know. You can write your logic in any language and then target WASM as a compilation target. Um, and the single runtime can support it. Um, so the polyglot nature of WASM, super important for us. And as we do this uh, increased density of functions, we want to make sure we do it responsibly and safely. And the strong sandboxing that WASM provides really helps with that. Uh, language interoperability, that is a bonus. Today when function needs to talk to another function, I have a Java function talking to a JavaScript function they have to serialize and deserialize back into JSON from native objects. That is a penalty that, I mean, we have optimized it to the extent possible, but with WASM components and uh, WRPC, and it can get to the next level where, the, where a component written in Go and a component written in REST, and they can talk to each other, and we don't have to serialize to a text-based format, and the interoperability is much strong. So to take you through our journey of how we have explored this and where we are now, I'll call upon Ritesh. Thank you, Kamsi. So as a platform engineering team, uh, we wanted to maintain a single polyglot runtime with increased density of co-located functions. At the same time, we want each function to be completely sandboxed and isolated. 
So WebAssembly component model enables us to do that, along with providing some additional features like composition and reuse. So that is when we decided to start building our own uh, fast WASM runtime on top of WASM time. So during this process, we realized that we need to build a lot of core uh, ecosystem components for WASM, right? That's when we started looking out for, at some open source projects. Is there some project out there, you know, from which we could, you know, reuse rather than building it all ourselves? Because it's not just building it, we'd have to maintain a lot of these components and considering the evolving ecosystem of WebAssembly, that's a lot of work. One particular project that stood out at that time was uh, WASM Club, CNCF WASM Club. Initially, uh, WASM Cloud to me, I, I looked at it as Kubernetes for WebAssembly, right? Where I could deploy WebAssembly. But there are some key benefits that uh, WASM Cloud provided, key features. Uh, if I want to highlight some of them, they are topology agnostic functions, right? Uh, capability providers and uh, dynamic linking between components and capability providers. I want to elaborate a couple of those features a little bit and you know, explain why it is important for us as a fast platform. Our functions today have some compute and IO, right? And where WebAssembly is at this point in time, we know that we cannot say that I can just take any code and compile it to WebAssembly and run it efficiently. For example, if I have to write some code that interacts with the Data, a relational database and I want to manage a pool of connections, I would choose to write it as a native binary. The WASM cloud capability providers allow me to do that today, right? And while I can write it as uh, this particular database code as a native binary, my function code, which has the rest of the compute could still be in compiled to WebAssembly. So the dynamic linking with capability providers allow my function code to interact with this native binary code in a seamless manner. So tomorrow I could decide to actually swap out this uh, native binary native binary with an actual WebAssembly component when we think that, you know, we have reached a point where we could actually write that piece of code in WebAssembly. That's one advantage, right? There are a couple of other advantages uh, which we actually want to highlight uh, from a platform engineering perspective. Today, we deal with a variety of different data sources. And when we want to increase the density of functions, we want to increase the number of instances of a function, we, we do hit certain limitations. Some of our data sources could be legacy data sources which have certain connection limits, right? So capability providers allow us to scale the capabilities like you know, data source IO and the function code independently, which is another added benefit. It also allows us to reduce the size of our function binary, right? They are no longer doing all these uh, heavy lifting of the data source connection and all of that. It's offloaded. So with that, we decided to build our fast runtime on top of WASM Cloud. And uh, as we mentioned, as Wamsi covered in the earlier slide, our whole goal as a fast platform is to offload all the responsibilities from the developer. A developer in our company should be only responsible for writing function code, which consists of business logic. Everything else should be taken care of by our platform. So in this slide, I want to walk you through the process of how we take that function code and compile it to a web assembly and deploy it in our runtime. So the developer will write function code and they just push this function code to a repository. Our deployment pipeline will take that function code and compile it to a WASM component. We call it the function WASM component. And then we decorate it with a security decorator, which adds certain auth and auth Z capabilities to it, and then some other security filters. Now, we compose this secure component inside and wrap it in a platform component, which actually enables or adds a couple of interfaces through which the people can invoke this business logic or the function code. This platform component is what we deploy in WASM time. 
this is our function. Now, this is how we actually took a regular function, business code, and made it into an enterprise-ready WebAssembly platform component. This is what we deploy on top of, on Wasm Cloud. And uh, Wasm Cloud provides a bunch of features to highlight a couple, it's secret management, config management, et cetera. Now, any client can invoke this function using multiple interfaces, through multiple interfaces. And as a platform, we also provide a development SDK to the function developers, through which the function developers can actually write code through which they can interact with another function deployed in that platform, or they could actually use another WASM component like they use another traditional library, but across language boundaries now. They could also invoke or call a capability provider. So we use the WASM Cloud uh, you know, uh, component SDK to create our own custom capability providers. And we have also contributed uh, so to some of the open source providers as well. Uh, and uh, transitioning from that, in this slide, I want to talk about some of the capabilities that we are reusing from our platform. So we have an advantage of having a mature platform with thousands of developers already using it, is that uh, we have pipelines and we have utilities that the developer community is very familiar with. And when we are building this WASM runtime, we don't have to rebuild all of it. We didn't have to rebuild all of it. We were able to reuse a lot of these features that the platform already had with minor tweaks to adapt to the WebAssembly ecosystem, right? Some of them, uh, highlighting some of them, we have a federated secret management system where every function team has the ability to manage their own secrets. They decide who has access to read and update secrets and so and so. We are able to entirely reuse that. We have our deployment pipelines. We have a repository automation process, which is kicked off by another federated open API spec review process, where, you know, to explain what it is, once you create an open API spec and your PR is approved and merged, our uh, automation will create your repositories and the pipelines and all that for you. All of that is entirely reused here. In addition to that, uh, thanks to WebAssembly component model, we actually have a bunch of utilities that we use as a platform. Many of those utilities we have written in languages like Go, which actually compile to WebAssembly. We can now take those utilities and convert them to WebAssembly components and reuse them across language boundaries. Speaking about reuse, we didn't just want to stop at our platform components. We actually wanted to enable that and empower our developers as well. So that the developers can create and reuse components in across the community, across the company. We today have uh, something we call as the function explorer, where the developers can go and find out the functions that are available out there and reuse these functions. We are going to extend this, we are extending that function explorer to a component explorer, where a developer can find multiple categories of WebAssembly components there that can be reused. And these components are deployed as OCI artifacts. So this allows us to actually use our existing you know, repository management systems. And uh, we are also providing a SDK to the developers using which they can actually use these WebAssembly components deployed as OCI artifacts in their function code. And uh, this is how we are trying to actually enable, you know, create right ones, reuse everywhere. And of course, the first language, now we are building a polyglot runtime, we are going to support a variety of different languages. But of course, the first language that we want to support is the most popular language, right? Which is Go, obviously. <laughs> yeah. I want to talk a little bit about uh, our journey with uh, using Wasm Cloud so far. Uh, you all know it's an open source CNCF project, so we can deploy our functions anywhere. It allows us to deploy our functions anywhere. We have a strong partnership with the project maintainers with shared vision and goals. And uh, along with using Wasm Cloud, we have made a lot of significant contributions to the Wasm Cloud project itself, which actually earn, we earned the ability to influence the roadmap as well. Um, and I want to finally talk about some of our contributions. We have made a lot of contributions to uh, Wasm Cloud, not just in terms of code, but also in terms of vision and uh, you know driving some of the core features that are available today. I'm sure a lot of you guys are using. 
uh, to name a few, I'm sure secret management, shared manifest, path-based routing, so and so, right? So I see that our contributions are not just uh, restricted to Wasm Cloud, these are actually you know, influencing the broader Wasm ecosystem as well. So with that, I want to actually uh, show a quick demo where uh, I want to show, uh, you know, give you a simulation of what it looks like from a function developer's point of view to go from an open API spec in our platform, write the open API spec, and actually generate a function and deploy that function in an environment. So I'll switch over to the demo. Uh, I want to ensure that the font is good enough for everybody. Is the font good enough? Okay. So in our platform, we also, I'm not going to cover the repository creation process. We have a process that even you provide the function name, once it is approved, it creates a repo and all of that, right? I'm going to start from the open API spec. Step one here is going to be the function developer it has to create an open API spec. So here we are going with an example function, which is read address version one. So read address is the function. It actually takes a, a simple ID and returns an object that contains a message and uh, details. I just made it up, right? So this may have been a dummy function. It's not real. Yeah, it's not a real function. It's not a function running in American Express. It's just, it's a made up function, right? So uh, this is uh, the process of, uh, now I'm going to just generate the uh, the code. So this is not just generating the code. This is uh, you know taking the open API spec. It's doing everything in the background, which includes generating the wit interface for it. We have built uh, a utility called Open API to wit. We even have our custom you know way in which we manage our configuration. This will translate it to Wasm Cloud configuration, deployment configuration, and all of that. Now, if you look at this code. You know, it generated a Go module for you, and it has in it a handle, and the handle has the already has the types which are based on the Open API spec, and uh, you know you the function developer just has to go here and update the business logic and write the business logic, right? And now if I go ahead and uh, deploy this function, okay, I. I went ahead and deployed this function. So some of the key aspects I want to highlight is that uh, you know uh, we it automatically we automatically generated the wit interface. The developer did not have to worry about all of that, right? Everything is generated. They just worry about the function code. Now let me see if the function is deployed. Okay, the function is deployed. Now let's go ahead and test this function. Okay, you see that the function. The function that was generated was already deployable, and not only is it deployable, you can actually, you know, it has observability built into it. You can see that, you know, you are able to see the traces and uh, all of that, right? So now I just want to go ahead and, uh, you know, make a change. This, I'm not simulating a local development, I'm trying to simulate what it looks like to deploy it to an environment. So now if I go ahead and update the details, I'll just uh, use, thank you. Uh, uh, this and I'll just do function reload and let's see. So the changes are reflected, right? So uh, yeah. So <laughs> thank you. So if you look at uh, if you if you saw the developer workflow and if you looked at the function code, uh, this is thanks to again. A lot of uh, you know contributions from there were people who spoke about this earlier. You know, uh, thank you guys. You know, all of us together made this happen, right? So one thing to note is that you didn't see any WebAssembly. The developer didn't have to worry about WebAssembly at all here, right? They wrote function code, and this looks like a regular Go module. Rest of it is taken care of by our platform automation. Uh, when we started working on WebAssembly. Uh, I think I was talking to Bailey Hayes and somebody mentioned it. I don't know who mentioned the statement earlier that if we do it right, people don't even need to know that we're using WebAssembly. So this is our small effort to make that a reality in our company and for our developers. So with that, thank you. <laughs> yeah, definitely early days. There's a lot more to come. Um, as you all know, the ecosystem is evolving. 
And this is, um, last six months is when I think we've done most of this work uh, in partnership with Wasm Cloud. And uh, yeah, it's not truly yet in production, <laughs> just a disclaimer, but we are getting there. Um, there's a lot of promise. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, uh, so there are a few things here, right? The, the significant contribution to the cold start in our existing, uh, in you know, most fast platforms will be the connecting to data sources, right? So with the capability providers, we are actually able to, you know, overcome a lot of that. And another advantage is that the WASM code is small and lightweight, it loads faster, so that also helps in cold start. So the cold start is, you know, what we observe is in the current, uh, you know, observations, we see that the cold start is better. Yeah, we have more work to do to really benchmark and show for different types of workloads and different types of initialization what the delta is. But because we are moving the long pole here to happen at uh, ahead of time uh, during deployment rather than at runtime, we expect this will be uh, significantly better. Uh, but uh, we'll benchmark. Yeah. Oh, they, we don't go through the file. What I said is we go through a JSON, like a JavaScript uh, interface uh, object notation, right? That's on the wire format. But I'm just curious, like, does using yeah. WASM to connect to disparate components improve your security as well as kind of convenience? I don't expect security to change, to be honest, because the even today, function to function calls go through an authentication and authorization layer. And as uh, Ritesh has shown, we, for every component we are layering an auth and auth. So that's not a shortcut we can kind of remove. That's still going to be there. And so it's not any less or more secure. It's still the same. You actually just alluded to what my question. I'm over here. Oh, sorry. sorry. Andy Donnell here. Um, First of all, that, that was <laughs> an incredible demo. Um, but my mind is is spinning around that auth and auth z wrapper, the platform component wrapper you you alluded to in the in the demo. But yeah, I'm curious how you guys are managing some of the the IM that, like all, wiring that stuff, up, gluing those things yeah. together because there's yeah, got to yeah. be some magic going on under so, that. Yeah. yeah. There, there, some of it is definitely <laughs> magic that I may not be able to yeah, that's give a, a lot sauce. of detail. <laughs> but all I can say is if you've seen Luke's last year's presentation about how we use WebAssembly components to layer in platform logic, that is the concept. What goes in the Tata and Adzi is what goes in there. Yes. Yes. Yes, please. Cut. Um, uh, I want to ask, uh, how do you uh, maintain the versioning of the functions? So, for example, if a function is deployed and it is being used by different components or applications, and later on, like, you change the functionality, just as you uh, uh, showed in the example. So, some applications uh, might still be using the old function, and they want, don't want to change at the same time as the other application. So, yeah. No, the responsibility of uh, you're talking. We are talking about breaking changes here, right? So uh, when you deploy a function, for example, read address dot v1, right? It it's not a. We actually give delegate the responsibility over to the function developer to ensure that the changes they make do not break their existing, you know, plans. So it sticks with how what kind of change it is. If it sticks with the open API spec and they're not breaking it, the existing client should not be impacted. But they are, if they are actually you know, stop sending, they stop sending a particular field, et cetera, which breaks their existing cli uh, no, uh, client's implementation. It is their responsibility, which is uh, the same applies to our function you know, developers and users today. And that is like pretty well managed because, you know, our function development teams 
also they don't have the responsibility of doing the cross cutting concerns but they do uh, they do have the responsibility of managing their changes and ensuring that their changes don't break existing clients yeah uh, quickly to add contract version and uh, implementation version are different and contract version as long as it is not having breaking changes implementation you can keep iterating and the idea is with this dynamic linking which is what we use in our current platform even without wasm implementation can keep iterating you can keep deploying a new version of your implementation every day and your consumers don't have to change because the linking is happening at runtime and that is what with this dynamic linking in wasm cloud we are expecting to use Yes. Uh, one I think there was someone uh, there. Yeah. Who was, uh, Let him answer, then I'll give, I'll give it to him. Yeah, sure. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you very much for presentation. I have a couple questions. So probably you're running it uh, with uh, some concurrency, every function, right? So how you control concurrency and memory allocation per instance of user function? So uh, you're asking about uh, the WASM runtime? In uh, the runtime? Yeah, for example, I'm developer, I created my function okay. and uh, just exposed it to public and uh, mm. someone connected uh, and created, I don't know, one million instances in yeah. parallel. Yeah. And uh, I, for every instance, I allocated the maximum amount of memory and just uh, kind of put sleep one million seconds, whatever. So the instance creation is not uh, controlled by the function developer? Right, we do have like at the platform level, even today when they deploy functions, we do have certain caps and limits to which you know they can you know create instances. For example, you know we can we control from a platform the number of instances that you know of a function that can be deployed, right? In addition to that, you know if you're talking from the client's perspective, right, we can always the function team can always increase the number of instances if they have reached the cap. Then of course it will be queued because you know. The request will be queued, and you know it, their executions will slow down. So you have queue basically in front of uh, in front of every function. So pretty much, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was wondering about. Uh, well, first of all, congratulations on the demo. It was amazing. Thank you. And I was wondering if you could just briefly describe you know, how much harder, or I would be from the developer perspective, if the developer were to deploy instead as an alternative, you know, using classic or uh, creating or deploying on a container infrastructure. You know, how much easier is it this way as you use in the demo? It looked almost too easy. And how would that equivalate into uh, if you were running or deploying on containers for the developer? Uh, yeah, actually, the we haven't demoed the real deployment pipeline that we actually use in the company. Uh, this is from a development he has shown you a CLI, but um, from a ease of development perspective, deployment perspective, the core uh, value is the time it takes to deploy. You deploy a container, it takes minutes to complete the deployment and start up really. Functions, we deploy functions, be it was and be it the other runtimes, they deploy into running containers. They deploy in seconds and minutes, and that is, uh, uh, from an experience perspective, they still use the same pipelines. Mm -hmm. It's okay. just, you know, uh, how long it takes to finish. The latency and, yeah. Yeah. aspect, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any more questions? Yes. Okay. So, you can the API with the file, you add a couple of new fields, and then, and then you um, regenerate that which file will overwrite the developer's changes? Yeah, uh, so if they are changing the open API spec, yeah. then uh, what, what we have is it will regenerate the weight and it will be result in another PR, right? It will result in another pull request and then you know it's up to the team whether what they if, want to merge. What if the developer already implemented some business logic? Will that business logic be a clobber or? Uh, let's go through this process. Now, uh, developer has created a function version one yeah. Right of the function, he has generated the code, written the business logic, deployed it. Now he goes ahead and changes the open API spec, which has to go through a spec review again. Somebody has to review that open API spec yep. and then merge it. That's when it will update the rest of the code along with the width and open a PR. So only when that PR is merged will that you know code be 
yeah, updated. So typically, if I am from that team, I see that the you know the code has been merged, but it has overwritten some of the business logic. So what we typically do is we don't overwrite. At that time, if you are recreate regenerating the function, it doesn't overwrite your Go module. It overwrites your okay. Wait interface first. The, then the module has to be manually updated. We don't overwrite it with this file. Okay. okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. This is the first time generation. What we showed you is the first time generation. Yeah. Generation. Future changes, the expectation is people don't change bit. We hide bit under a generated folder because again, from a cognitive load perspective, developers shouldn't have to think about bit and open API. We want them to think about open API. They make changes. If they make changes there, the bit gets updated. Depending on the types of changes they are making, if they drop a field, obviously that's going to break their Existing logic. That's what I think your point is. Uh, that is something we'll have to we'll have to deal. Yeah, with. I mean, typically yeah. the 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 contract doesn't change that much because like you, if you have like a front end, you don't want their application to change. Correct. Usually that's pretty static. But there Correct. could be cases where you may add a field. Yes. Your business changes. Typically, you don't delete fields. Yeah. yeah. Correct. You add a yeah. field and then will it affect the code? But you're saying that uh, yeah, yeah. Code yeah. Just not change. change. You may have to then. Yeah. And the field also in your code module. Correct. Yeah, yeah. The subsequent change to that particular open API spec will only regenerate the weight and the open API spec with the weight. It will not make the function, you know, function change. It won't change the function implementation. Yeah. Yes, yes. They have to ha handle it because the types are already there. You know, uh, unless they are actually changing the core request type, that's when they'd have to change a significant amount of the code. The types are already there. They, they, we don't need to override it at that time. 